G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. First dog on the moon, 1st of March 2015. Good evening, patriots. Welcome to First Dog on the Moon's Nightly Nightly News. I'm Walkley Award-winning newsreader for The Guardian, First Dog on the Moon. What a week it's been, Australia. Tonight, we'll review the last seven days in the political, cultural and sporting life of our nation. Also, weather. There was some serious kerfuffle in Canberra this week. Gillian Triggs, Human Rights Commissioner, was grilled in Senate estimates about the cruel, unconscionable abuse of the innocent, specifically Senator Ian MacDonald, who hadn't read the report. But enough about that. One of the most interesting things was the men of federal parliament. No, not the calendar. The way they conducted themselves, especially around the ladies. Is it sexist to shush some chick if she just keeps going on and on? Somebody has to do something. Not long after this, the Attorney General George Brandis was overheard telling the leader of the opposition in the Senate, Senator Penny Wong, who happens to be a woman, to settle down. She was in a tizzy about something, apparently. We cross now live to the Attorney General's press conference, where I'm sure he'll be able to explain. Why can't a woman be more like a man? Men are so decent, such regular chaps, ready to help you through any mishaps. Ready to buck you up whenever you are glum. Why can't a woman be a chum? <coughs> Meanwhile, on the other side of politics, federal opposition leader Bang Tiddlywink had this to say about asylum seeker children in detention. He was also asked about his party's policy with regard to mandatory data retention. He then went on to explain the ALP policy on Australia's ongoing role in Iraq. And finally, what does the opposition leader Bombo Poutine do on the weekend these days? And now to sport. The Gold Coast Titans and the Gold Coast Suns are both embroiled in a drug scandal as a result, both teams have decided to give up professional sport altogether and just hang, maybe do some surfing. We cross now live to the dressing rooms of the newly formed Gold Coast Ravers. And last but not least, here's Andrew Bolt with the weather. Thanks for listening, Patriots. This has been the Nightly Nightly News Weekly News Review tonight for the First Dog on the Moon Institute. You're welcome. See, don't say you don't get yodelling on this program. It's what we do best. Coming up to 10 o'clock, uh, and that's it for Sunday. Yep. That's just about exactly what the week was like. I like to dance and tap my feet, but I can't do nothing with them. Last week it was printed in the Australian that Tony Abbott had a brain fart, considered sending three and a half thousand Australian Army personnel to go to Iraq and conduct a crusade against the godless death cult ISIL. He denied it, he denied it, he spent days denying it. And then suddenly he said that he's not planning on sending three and a half thousand Australians on their own, he's planning on sending one and a half thousand Australians and they're going to take along a contingent of Kiwis with them. And although the Australian and New Zealand troops are going to be operating side by side on a common mission far from home over in the Muddle East, it's not going to be officially badged as an ANZAC mission because he's busy celebrating, commemorating Anzac Day, that's that that's part of his game plan for the year. 
may interest some of my overseas subscribers and viewers to know that Australia is planning on spending a total of 300% of what Britain is spending on commemorating World War One. So a lot more people live in England than live in Australia, but we're going to spend three times more money gross figures that's not proportional to the population or anything like that so when you consider that they've got more of them and we're spending three times the money yeah he's got big plans for glorifying war come anzac day has tony abbott um and he's going to send an australian contingent with some kiwis to go to the middle east and and fight with isil well no he's not going to fight with isil <coughs> this one and a half thousand are going to join the 450, I think, special air service who are already over there providing some security for the 650 who are looking after the dozen fighter planes and an aerial refueling tanker and probably an AWACS as well uh, and a couple of star lifters, at least one of them, to cart their ass and trash around the place for them. Um, and what, what the SAS blokes are supposed to be doing is teaching the Iraqis how to fight and teaching the Kurdies how to fight. Um, I'm pretty sure the Iraq male population has been steeped in violence and militarism for long enough that they've got a reasonable idea of how to fight. Um, what Australia is getting itself bogged into is a rerun of what the Americans did when the Iraqization of the Iraq war, when they trained all the Iraqi civilians to be Iraqi military and militia, and they were going to look after the whole, the Yankees then pulled out and it all fell apart. And, and that was a carbon copy of the Vietnamization that they did in what used to be French Indochina. And you know, it didn't work for the French either. Um, foreign power comes in, throws its weight around, makes lots of mistakes, irritates everybody, kills a lot of innocent people, pays a lot of guilty people to be corrupt, and then pisses off, it all goes to shit. Well, it went to shit last time because the Americans trained up a whole bunch of people who didn't want to fight for the Pentagon's puppet strings. And now all of that equipment is in the hands of ISIL, and ISIL are deemed to be the enemy. And we're going to go over there and we're going to do it all over again, train up a whole bunch of different fellas who... You know, they're locals and we're the outsiders and they're not going to like having us go over there. So I think we're spending $500 million on this warriorism fantasy, militaristic daydream. Despite the fact that not since Abraham Lincoln said, let's have a war, we will go and free the slaves. Nobody since then has ever gone into a war saying, oh, we've got this declared war aim. They've never come out of it after launching a war of aggression with that aim secured. Now, I'm pretty sure that when Serbia declared war, or was it? No. Yeah, Serbia declared war on Austro-Hungary because an Austro-Hungarian, no, a Serbian had shot an Austro-Hungarian. Um, therefore, Germany was at war with Russia and to keep the Tsar safe, England and France declared war on Germany. The Ottoman Turkish Empire was connected to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so therefore we were all at war with Turkish and Turkey and the Caliphate as well. Did the Russian Tsar emerge from World War I intact? Because that's what the British were fighting for when they started the war or when they, they volunteered to go into the war. In the Second World War, I'm pretty sure what the British decided to go to war over was to keep Poland safe for democracy. I remember growing up in Poland was a Soviet satellite state living under a communist dictatorship. So they didn't emerge from that war having secured their war aims. They also... Um, they were attacked by the Japanese and the Japanese were trying to establish an imperial Japanese empire in the South Pacific, shaped roughly like a rectangle. Well, that didn't work for them, did it? It just didn't work. Um, in the Spanish Civil War, the International Brigade decided to launch a war of rebellion against the nationalists who I think they got there by way of a coup. but. 
Spain is no longer a Francoist nationalist state, and the Republicans didn't get up either. My point is that God does not seem to favour the big battalions. God does not seem to favour um, preemptive military expeditions. Wars of conquest sort of went out of flavour a very long time ago. And Tony Abbott seems to want to crank up the terrorist rhetoric, crank up the military rhetoric, crank up the sense of danger. He wants Australians to submit to all manner of surveillance. He's already overturned the presumption of innocence and the burden of proof shifting from the state to prove somebody's guilty onto the accused to prove that they're innocent. I, I have grave fears for where it's leading, but in the interim, he's doing a great job of destroying the Liberal Party's credibility. You know, the idea that just because somebody's had a successful career as a white shoe real estate salesman, or they've got a law degree and they've been working in a political back room for 15 or 20 years, it doesn't actually mean they've got any clear idea of how the world works or what's happening or what government's role is in responding to the demands of the citizenry, which generally amounts to more pay for less working time and better holidays, better sick leave, free hospitals, free old age care, good unemployment benefits, stuff like that. The demands of the people who want to exploit the environmental surplus in order to harvest everything so they can get a surplus which can then be sold, their demand is to be let loose. You know, They don't want there to be any environmental or civil libertarian or human rights constraints on their plans to make money. And somewhere off on the fringe, you've got the people who've actually got a little bit of additional above average intelligence and they've gone off and they've qualified under peer reviewed systems to have a few letters after their name that indicate they actually know something about a couple of particular subjects. And when they talk out about their subject, be it biology or climate science, these politicians and businessmen and wannabe workers and consumers have decided that you know they accept the science when it comes to the doctor says you, you need to have a heart operation. They accept the science when somebody says if you turn this key in this car, the engine will start because we know enough about science to build a car that'll work. They don't accept the science about how ecospheres work and biodiversity is vital and you can't keep clear filling and logging and mining everything. You can't wind up with a planet full of little bubble domes with eco metropoli because it doesn't fucking work. To grow a loaf of bread takes $23 worth of electricity if you grow the wheat indoors under lights and it's going to put out eight kilograms of carbon. Whereas if you grow it in a paddock 5,000 kilometres away and carry the wheat to the mill and grind it into flour and then cook it, you're only looking at 0.7 of a kilogram. And you buy a loaf of bread baked, ready to go for $3 in supermarkets all over the country. Your eco-cities aren't going to work. But anyway, we're going downhill and the politicians are putting on a facade of worrying about events while they're actually worrying about their own careers. Meanwhile, the extreme weather events are turning up on the scientists predicted schedule and it's tearing the economy to pieces by raising the insurance premium premiums to the point where businesses can't make money doing anything. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.